The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer music festivals are back. So to celebrate all this July, the Agenda in the Summer revisits conversations with a diverse cast of musicians and music experts. Tonight, the science of tone deafness from 2016, my first year at TVO. Everyone hits a bum note now and then as they sing along with their favorite songs. But for about 2.5% of the population, those with tone deafness or amusia, practically every note misses the mark. And for music lover, journalist, and tone deaf aspiring vocalist Tim Faulkner, that meant a challenge. His new book is Bad Singer, The Surprising Science of Tone Deafness and How We Hear Music. And he joins us now with Frank Russo, professor in the Department of Psychology, and Director of the Science of Music, Auditory Research and Technology, or SMART Lab for short, at Ryerson University. Welcome to the both of you. Great to be Thanks. here. Now, I think we all want to be part of an exclusive community, but 2.5% of the uh, population. For you, Tim, that's devastating news to hear, isn't it? Yeah, it was pretty hard to take. How did you take the news? How did you find out? Uh, I went to a lab in Montreal um, where really the Isabel Peretz is really the pioneer in this kind of research. Mm -hmm. uh, and her lab tested me, and she said, you're classic in music. And you love music. And I love music. That, and that su surprised her, mm -hmm. um, which then the book, uh, you know, I was sort of felt compelled to find out, OK, if I'm tone deaf, what am I hearing? Right. And it, is what I'm hearing that different from what everyone else is hearing? So just to get into the conversation, let's start with a definition. Uh, tone deafness means what, Tim? Well, um, tone deafness, or as the researchers call it, uh, amusia, or congenital amusia, is, uh, it's not, nothing to do with the ear. We, we talk about tone deaf or tin ear, but it's in the brain, and basically there's um, a neural pathway, the arcuate fasciculus, um, that in my brain and other amusics is underdeveloped. The analogy I use is, is like roads. Um, so a highly musical person would have a 400 series highway, and I have a little pokey like a country blue highway, no, a, a country, a country road. road. Very so the information is not moving efficiently between two lobes of my uh, brain, the mm -hmm. perception and the production uh, lobes. Now, Frank, are the brains of tone deaf people different from non-tone deaf people? They are, and, and Tim got it right. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically there's some connective uh, fibers between the auditory cortex, so the part of the brain that deals with processing sound, mm -hmm. and the motor planning areas of the brain. So the motor planning areas are also, we don't think about uh, singing and speech as, as movement, but they are movement. And you need to have this very nice connective uh, pathway uh, intact in order to reproduce song accurately. And uh, it, it is true that, uh, that congenitally tone-deaf individuals have an underdeveloped pathway. So what you just said, Tim, about you, you're trying to understand what it is that you're hearing. So what is it, are, what are you hearing if it's not what we're hearing? I'm assuming that I'm not tone-deaf. I'm not sure if I am or not. Well, th this is the thing. So I'm not hearing pitch as well as I should. It doesn't mean that all pitches sound the same to me, but if they're close together, I can't tell them apart. So some of the nuances of, of music that are related to pitch, mm -hmm. I, I'm probably missing out on some. Um, but there's a lot more to music than pitch. And I think in the, the bias in sort of Western music and s both the research and the theory is that uh, it's all about pitch, a little bit of rhythm. Um, and I argue in the book that we really undervalue timbre. Um, and I think we undervalue it because it's very hard to describe what it is. And so far, it's proven to be impossible to measure. What is timbre? So timbre, if you look in the textbook, they say the, the tone color of an instrument, which isn't really th that helpful. It's the, the analogy I use is it's like the terroir of a wine. So the terroir of a wine is, is the taste is, is shaped by the 
uh, soil and the climate and, and the topography, you know, like where, it's, where the grape is grown. So mm -hmm. the same gro grape grown in two different places would have different tastes. And, and so um, it's the same with music. So uh, a guitar has a different timbre than an oboe, say. But two different guitars made by two different luthiers would have different timbres. And even the same guitar played by two guitarists uh, will have different timbres. So, you know, you, you could pick two guitars, you know, your two favorite guitarists, and they, they could play the same song and they would sound different. And of course, when we get to singers, it's snowflake territory. Everybody has his or her own timbre. Everyone is unique. In, in terms of voice. And, and the same thing, like, even when we're not singing, we're just talking, mm -hmm. people recognize my voice, they recognize your voice. Uh, and, and, and so that's, that's timbre. But um, I think that's what I'm hearing a lot. You know, Frank has some interesting theories about music being much more than what we hear. What are I'll those? let you mm -hmm. talk about that. Sure, so I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I completely agree with Tim that mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't tend to focus on timbre in, in uh, theoretical descriptions of music. Um, but I think what Tim is referring to is that uh, I've done a bunch of research um, uh, and uh, along with other colleagues looking at uh, visual aspects of music, for example. Uh, we think about music as primarily about sound and primarily about pitch, but uh, it, what we see brings so much to the personality, to the emotional communication, and Tim is clearly getting all that. And it's enriching not only his view of what's going on, but it's also enriching his uh, perception of the sound, I would argue. Uh, so beyond the visual modality, we also have touch or vibrotactile. So uh, if you're in a space with loud instruments, you're close to them, or there's amplification. You can feel the vibrations. And you're feeling the vibrations. And that might also play a role in, in some of what Tim experiences in, in music. I don't know how important a role, but, but you know, I, I would say that Tim is relying more heavily on these cues outside of pitch. So maybe the timbre, maybe the visual characteristics, maybe the rhythm and timing. Now, how would you go about diagnosing somebody with tone deafness? So there's a standard test that's been developed. Uh, there have been a few competing tests, but we've come as a community to a consensus uh, view on the appropriateness of one test. And this test uh, has a number of uh, different subtests, but the main one uh, involves presenting two melodies. And the melodies would change by one note. And you're to say whether these two melodies are the same or different. And typically, people would have very little difficulty with this. They'd get eight out of 10. An A music individual would get something like 5 out of 10, uh, possibly 6 out of 10. The important point is that um, when we look at this statistically, they're not part of the normal statistical distribution. So they are what we would call two standard deviations away from the center of the distribution. And what we would infer from that in science generally is that this is a different group. So Tim is just not another singer. He's a special breed of singer, and there's a population of people like Tim mm -hmm. that have their own distribution, but they're not part of the typical distribution. Uh, so you know, within the typical distribution, you're going to have excellent singers, you're, you're going to have virtuosos, you're going to have poor pitch singers. Most people who identify themselves as tone deaf are in the normal distribution. Tim is not. He's outside it. He's in his own club. He's unique. <laughs> we all, well, I, I, I mean, there are other in music, but where I am, I won't say unique, but where I'm especially rare is mm. that I'm in music and I love music. Now, and why is that unique? Like, why is well, that different? Most people who are in music, uh, and a music comes from like a, a, the Greek, you know, without music. Mm -hmm. Most people who are in music um, either are indifferent to it, it's like go going to a speech in a, a foreign language, or they actively dislike it. It's, it's really unpleasant. There are people out there that don't like music? <clears throat> Oh, absolutely. Oh, and yeah. there are people who are not in music who don't like music. Are these people like people or aliens? <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of the difficulty with finding. Uh, yeah. So my colleague that Tim mentioned, Isabel Peretz in Montreal, who's done a lot of research on tone deaf individuals, mm -hmm. she has such difficulty finding these individuals because they don't want to come out. You know, people assume that there's something wrong with you emotionally or you're less human because you don't like music. 
but they, yeah, they certainly exist. So and that was a joke. I'm not making fun. Yeah, but, it, but it's a joke that a lot of people would make at yeah. Tim's expense. Mm -hmm. And and uh, yeah. So but it's interesting. You say you, it's difficult finding them. It is. But you you did uh, in the book. You talk about how you relatives who are also tone deaf. Is this hereditary? It is. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, if you are uh, a music, you have a forty percent chance. Mm -hmm. um, I have four sisters. They are all a music. Uh, my mother is a music. We're, my father's uh, dead, but uh, we're pretty sure he was in music. Well, we have a clip of William Hung, the infamous American Idol contestant, singing Ricky Martin's She Bangs. Let's take a look. She bangs, she bangs. Oh, baby, when she moves, she moves. I go crazy because she looks like a flop, but she stings like a bee, like every girl in history. She bangs, she bangs. Thank I'm you. wasted by the way Thank she... Thank you. You can't sing, you can't dance, so what do you want me to say? Um, I already gave my best, and there's, I have no regrets at all. Good for you. That's good. That's, now that's good. William. That's good. That's the best attitude yet. And you know, I have no professional training. I love his response, by the way. Um, but in the book, you write that he's actually singing on in key? Well, uh, Peter Fordresser, who's at the University of Buffalo, um, analyzes and he said he's matching this, the pitches uh, -huh. uh that that ricky martin did perfectly well, and he's doing he it like and, and yeah. but and this speaks to what frank was talking about there being so much more to music than just pitch um there there, there are other problems one is his his rhythm is not good it's kind of robotic so. and um the the timbre is he's got a very thin voice and the accents you know, I'm sorry to say, is not helping him. Mm -hmm. We're so used to the sort of bland American accent. You know, even British bands would, would sing like that. Um, so everyone says, oh, the guy can't sing, but it's actually not his pitch that's a problem. And let's not forget the visual stuff, right? He's, along with the staccatic kind of rhythm, mm -hmm. you know, his movements aren't, they're abrupt and uh, so do you think we, they're not we helping would have, with the musicality. Uh, so do you think we would have received him differently if we had heard him on the radio without actually seeing him? It would, I would, uh, we could do that test and yeah. I would say it would be a little bit better. Uh, and if we could make his rhythm a little more natural, it would be a little better. If we could process the sound of his voice to give it a slightly deeper timbre, and that's easy to do, mm -hmm. we could make it better. That's an interesting idea for an experiment, yeah. but uh, we haven't done that one. <laughs> well, there are a lot of singers out there, like Neil Young, Elvis Costello, Bob Dylan, to name a few, who, you know, some people might say that their voices are not really that great. That's not me saying that. Um, but how do you explain their success? Well, I wouldn't put Elvis Costello in the same category as... <laughs> That's one of as, your favorites. The, no, no, but yeah. I, I, I didn't say... Like, I talk about him in the book. Yeah. I don't think he... he Like, I talk about people who are, you know can't sing, Dylan and Neil Young and people like that. I wouldn't put Costello in, I wouldn't say he's a virtuosic singer, mm -hmm. but he's not in the bad singer category. But I think it, 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 it's the fact that um, the bad singers that we talk about, Dylan and Neil Young and even people like Patti Smith and whatnot, the fact that we say they're bad singers and yet they're hugely popular and, and people like Dylan and Neil Young have been popular since the 60s. Um, I think points to the fact that there's a lot more to good singing than nailing your pitches and having huge range. So there's a lot more to good singing than good singing. <laughs> uh, yes. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, emotional communication is huge. There's an authenticity about Neil Young and Bob Dylan. Um, and I, I would argue that they're not... Uh, so Neil Young uh, uh, is maybe hitting more pitches than Bob Dylan. I'm splitting hairs here. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, both of them are not, uh, they're, they're not in the tone deaf camp. They're, they're in that norm, normal distribution. They're not the most pitch accurate, but uh, I would say that they're incredibly expressive. Uh, so what we found in some of our research is that um, judgments on, on emotional genuineness are not at all correlated with judgments on pitch accuracy. So you can take the same uh, singer and you would get very different perspectives on how well they're doing depending on what your yardstick is uh, and interestingly the emotional genuineness is tethered to their acting background and the pitch precision is tethered to their voice training background so it seems that 
different things you do to prepare yourself to be a singer influence these two different things that people look at. Um, so what does a smart lab do? We do a wide range of things. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we're cognitive neuroscientists, which means we, um, we uh, try to understand uh, different aspects of human behavior from the perspective of perception, uh, behavior, and the brain. Uh, and we do a lot of work on music and understanding how, we, how it is that we have emotional responses to music. These different aspects of music we've been talking about, the visual, the vibrotactile. We're also really interested in emotional communication. So I've been mentioning that word a bunch. So emotional communication is broader than, than just music. We have emotional communication in human speech, in gesture, in nonverbal communication. And I think the way that we process all these things is bundled together. It relies on the same neural mechanisms. We're trying to understand those neural mechanisms. And at the lab, you have uh, your subjects singing certain songs. Mm -hmm. what, how do you choose the songs, and what are some of those songs? So in, uh, <laughs> we don't normally test a music, so I'll say. It, uh, Tim kind of fell on my lap, and I was happy to receive <laughs> him and, and, and you know, do all sorts of fun things with him. Yeah. Uh, in, in Tim's case, we had him sing uh, uh, melodic intervals, so those are uh, sequences of two tones, so things like do, re, uh, nothing musical, just, mm -hmm. uh, and um, we also had him make a judgment as to whether that do, re was going up or going down. Uh, we're interested in the disconnect between his ability to, to reproduce what he hears and his ability to understand what he hears. Mm -hmm. We also spent a lot of time singing happy birthday, and that was great fun. Uh, he's tired of singing happy birthday, he's, but... Uh, but you had him sing happy birthday without the words, right? We did, well, yeah, actually, my colleague Isabel did. Oh, okay, so, it, yeah. that's, that's what I've heard. She says one of the things, the easiest way to tell if someone is, is a music is, okay. you know, if the, someone sings happy birthday and it's not in tune, but they can sing it. But mm -hmm. then when they try to do it without the words, la la, mm -hmm. um, they will, most people will give up after the, Second law. Yeah. My family, and every, they've tested everyone in my family. Uh, oddly enough, everyone in my family tries to finish the song. It's nowhere near uh, happy birthday, but it is tonal. There is a melody to it. It's just not anything related to happy birthday. Um, but the labs like happy birthday because everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. And that's why they get you to sing it, even though it's a terrible song. So we don't song. have to separate out songs that. Tim might know or mm -hmm. might not know if you... It's like a standard for everybody, I guess. It, it, yeah, if you've been living in this culture, you've probably heard it once or twice mm -hmm. and you're familiar with it. So we can get more at the production problem than a memory problem or something. Uh, the other, uh, there are many little tests and I won't get into all of them, but the other big one that we did, I, I would say, mm -hmm. is, uh, is called the beat alignment test. So another colleague, Annie Patel uh, and John uh, Everson, they developed a test that involves mm -hmm. standard, uh, very familiar pieces of music, often big band, jazz standards, uh, some, some popular rock tunes. What they've done is they've taken these pieces of music and they've overlaid them with a kind of a click track. Mm -hmm. So it's a beep. And, and the beeps fall on the salient beats of the music or they're off a little bit. And, and what are you trying to do with that? And you, Tim's job or anybody's job doing this test is to decide whether the clicks are aligned with the music or they're not. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, Tim does quite well in that test. Uh, he, he falls well within that normal distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so it really seems that his deficit is isolated, in, in his case at least, to pitch processing. That's not the same for all A musics. Mm -hmm. There are other A musics that also have some difficulty with rhythm. Uh, we talk about there being a developmental trajectory where you can imagine that if you have problems with pitch, maybe you don't spend as much time with music, maybe you're asked to step outside during choir rehearsals, there's all kinds of interesting stories, and you don't develop these other musical skills. Um, Tim is a little exceptional that way as well, that he, has, he, he appears to have the rhythm. Um, well, you talked about the emotional mm -hmm. um, aspect of it. Uh, when it comes to singing, how important is it for the singer to feel an emotional attachment to the song? Well, apparently, it's really important. Um, pitch is still <laughs> important if you don't want people to laugh at you too much. But um, 
I, th I think, you know, and, and going back to talking about Dylan and, and Neil Young, mm -hmm. um, they make up for their inability to be virtuosic singers by, by really communicating in, a, in an authentic way. Um, so the end of my book, uh, I do a house concert. I did two songs. Um, one of them was Blackbird by the Beatles, which afterwards people said to me, well, why did your singing coach make you do that? Because it's a really hard song. And I did a particularly bad job on that. The second song was a Joe Strummer song, which meant a lot more to me personally. Mm -hmm. It was also an easier song. Uh, and I think I did a... It was easier how? Well, it... it, it because it's, you have Black an emotional Bird, attachment I mean, to it? There's a lot of moving around mm -hmm. uh, in, in the melody. Would you... Yeah, there's big pitch leaps, mm -hmm. which are hard for all of us to get. Uh, very hard for Tim to get. But did you have a more of an emotional attachment to the Joe Strummer song? Yes. So I think, if, you know, even if I wasn't hitting the pitches, I was probably singing it better. And does the size of the venue matter when it comes to singing, like good singing? Uh, the simple answer is, is yes, but, you know, that could mean the, you know, the anxiety that's generated by the size of the venue, the acoustics. Um, uh, but certainly the venue is going to impact on your ability to perform well. Now, when I hear a song that I really like, my hand always goes up in the air, and some people get goosebumps. Is there a reason that this happens? Absolutely. Your hand goes up in the air. Yeah. I don't have an explanation I don't for know. Like, it. It just goes up like, yes. oh, that's a good song. <laughs> right, that's a I good see. song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So th that sounds more uh, like kind of language communication you're mm -hmm. proving, but yeah. uh, that's not a universal thing. But mm -hmm. certainly the hair standing up, uh, yeah, that, is, that appears to be... Uh, mostly universal. Um, most people get it. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on whether you like the music or not. Um, and it's, it's uh, some uh, low-level um, uh, arousal, uh, index of arousal. Mm -hmm. um, so these changes take place centrally, but they affect the whole body. And this is all part of the primitive limbic system that kept us alive as struggling humans in, uh, in unsettled times, but it, it does get regularly activated when we listen to music. So this is something we normally track in the lab. And uh, within a couple seconds of listening to a piece of music you like, you're sweating. And so your, your, uh, your hair is standing up on end to kind of cool the body. That's the, the assumed function of the hair standing up on end. That is so interesting. Now, what about the face? I mean, uh -huh. Tim, we've got you blown up behind us. You know, why do we make these interesting faces when we're enjoying a song or when we sing? Well, there, um, my, my view on it, is, so there's all <laughs> kinds of things that happen, and, and I can't explain all those wonderful images. But, <laughs> but there, we know that there's a kind of uh, mimicry that takes place during normal emotional communication. So when you smile, I uh -huh. smile. And that happens all the time when we're listening to songs. So that's something we've also tracked in the lab. Mm -hmm. And we find that within a couple hundred milliseconds of the singer singing happy, people are starting to smile. You don't see the smile necessarily, but if we're measuring muscle potentials on the face, we can detect it. Um, uh, if you get that kind of mimicry quicker, it's easier to make an emotional judgment about uh, what someone is conveying. Mm -hmm. uh, so as an example, uh, people with Parkinson's disease don't have this kind of automatic mirroring of other people's emotional displays. Um, and they have difficulty deciphering other people's emotions. We believe that that's the reason for that difficulty. But in, in any case, these faces happen all the time. Um, but we live in a culture that frowns on um, participating in music. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I say that we kind of mask those faces normally. Like it's not OK in most, let's say, in a classical concert venue to be doing this and to be. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in some venues, it would be more appropriate. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I'd say we're kind of struggling between this natural propensity to mirror the emotional expression and to get into the groove of the piece mm -hmm. and to be socially appropriate. Uh, the one place that, that I think of where the rules are broken up mm -hmm. is in people's cars. So if you see people driving around, mm -hmm. they're singing madly. Yeah. And I think they're, they're engaging in this automatic mimicry, and they're doing what they, 
want to do what uh, is part of it, you know in in the biology without the sensor of of other eyes and uh, protecting yourselves um, from uh, from judgment. judgment. Right. Yeah. Um, Tim, to what extent are humans innately musical? Well, this is a, a big debate, uh, and and. Um, Steven Pinker says that music is auditory cheesecake. It's just something we really like, but it's not essential. But there are lots of other people, uh, um, including Dan Levitin, who, who argue that, no, it, what, it is evolutionary. And going back to Darwin, um, so the, the evolutionary side you know, argues, well, you know, mating and dating, that if you were more musical, you would get more partners. Mm -hmm. uh, for cohesion, you know, for protection, a, a small group of people, they could use um, music to coordinate and to, to make sounds to, to you know, protect themselves. Um, the, the thing is that music is not, uh, there's no sort of evolutionary purpose to it that we can see. But one of the theories is that... Not that even communication? Well, it's different than, than language. So some people say, well, no, language is important. Mm -hmm evolutionary in an evolutionary sense but music isn't but one of the theories is that music and language developed together as some precursor to the two that there was something else before that mm -hmm. um, I, I, I argue in the book that in a way it doesn't really matter music is so important to us does it really matter if there was an evolutionary reason or not um, I mean my gut in the beginning was like oh well, of course it's evolutionary because it's so important mm -hmm. But you know, it, I kind of say, okay, well, look, if the if the you know the experts want to argue about it, they can argue about it. But we can just enjoy the music. Thank you very much for being here. We enjoyed your insight. Thank you. Coming up on the agenda in the summer. Not only is music uh, universal across all human societies, but singing to babies is universal. And so this attracted my attention, well, it's almost 30 years ago. Uh, and it was an activity that was performed largely by women and considered not really very important for anything. But if you thought, if you think about it, why would everybody around the world be doing this? So we started to look at what are babies processing? And they're processing a lot uh, in the music. And that is tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.